DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, is a very important biological molecule whose function is to store the genetic information that is found within the cell. So the cell, including eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, can use the DNA molecules to synthesize proteins and enzymes that are necessary for the cell's survival. In fact, whenever our cell or organism reproduces, each individual individual cell must replicate the DNA molecule and pass it down to the offspring. Now, what exactly is the composition of DNA? So, in the same way that proteins consist of individual units known as amino acids, DNA molecules are also polymers, meaning they consist of individual subunits known as nucleotides. And any given nucleotide consists of three parts. So, we have a deoxyribose sugar, which is a five-membered sugar. We have a nitrogenous base and we also have our phosphate group. Now, what exactly is the structure or arrangement of these three different types of uh, sections or groups within our nucleotide? So, this is one example of a nucleotide. We have our base, the nitrogenous base, attached to our center sugar, which is also attached to our phosphate group. Now, there are four different types of nitrogenous bases. We have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Now, adenine and guanine, or simply A and G, are two types of nitrogenous bases that consist of two rings. And these types of nitrogenous bases that consist of two rings are known as purines. And notice thymine and cytosine, or T and C, consist of only a single ring structure and these types of nitrogenous bases are known as pyrimidines. So let's look at the arrangement of our nucleotide and how the nucleotides bond to one another. So remember in a protein we have amino acids that bond to one another via covalent bonds known as dipeptide or peptide bonds. In the case of DNA, the individual subunits known as nucleotides bond to one another via bond known as a phosphodiester bond. So let's take a look at the following molecule. So we have one nucleotide and a second nucleotide. And notice that these two nucleotides bond to one another via the phosphodiester bond. So we have the phosphorus atom and we also have the two ester bonds shown here. And that's exactly why it's called a phosphodiester bond. Now, notice that the bonding takes place between the third carbon of one sugar and the fifth carbon of the second sugar and that's exactly why this is called a 3 to 5 bond. So this is our phosphodiester bond. So notice that because there are four different types of nitrogenous bases that means there are four different types of nucleotides and it is very common to call our nucleotide by the type of uh, nitrogenous base that it contains. So, for example, because this nucleotide contains the guanine nitrogenous base, we simply call the nucleotide the guanine. And because this contains the adenine nitrogenous base, this nucleotide can be called simply the adenine nucleotide. So, we have one nucleotide bonds to a second nucleotide via this phosphodiester bond. Now, DNA in cells, specifically in human cells, doesn't actually exist as a single strand of DNA. In fact, two strands of DNA that are complementary to one another actually bind to form a double-stranded DNA and that double-stranded DNA forms a coil that we call the double helix. And the two single-stranded DNAs bond to one another via a special type of dipole-dipole bond known as 
hydrogen bonds. So the thing that holds our two strands of DNA together to form our double helix are hydrogen bondings or hydrogen bonds between adjacent or opposite nucleotides, specifically our nitrogenous bases. So we have this nucleotide, which is right next to this nucleotide, and the bonding takes place between our adjacent or complementary nitrogenous bases. So guanine always forms hydrogen bonds with cytosine, while our adenine always forms hydrogen bonds with our thymine. And notice in the case of guanine and cytosine, we have three hydrogen bonds, and in the case of adenine and thymine, we only have two of these hydrogen bonds. So that means the guanine cytosine pair forms a more stable attraction than our adenine thymine. So if a, if a given DNA molecule contains more guanine cytosine pairs, that means the bonding between our two single-stranded DNA molecules is stronger. Now, one other important thing that we have to mention about the double helix is the directionality of our single-stranded DNA. So let's take a look at this single-stranded DNA that only consists of two nucleotides. So we have the guanine and the adenine. Notice that the guanine begins on our five carbon and it goes down to our three carbon while the second single strand of DNA begins with the third carbon and goes down to the fifth carbon and this type of opposite or reverse arrangement is known as anti-parallel that is the two single strand of DNA this one and this one run in the parallel direction but they run in the opposite opposite direction meaning that this goes from the 5 to the 3 carbon and this runs from the 3 to the 5 carbon. So once again we have our notice that if the first strand runs in a 5-3 direction then the complementary strand must run in the reverse 3 to 5 direction and this type of arrangement is known as anti-parallel and the reason the two DNA molecules run anti-parallel is to ensure that the bonding between our nitrogenous bases is exactly right so that we create strong bonds between our two DNA molecules and so that our double-stranded DNA molecule basically doesn't unzip itself spontaneously. So this is a slightly better description of our DNA molecule because this shows our double helix structure. So we have the blue and our purple strand. So the, the blue one begins at the 5N and goes all the way to the 3N, while the pink begins at the 3N and goes all the way to the 5N. And this is what we mean by the anti-parallel directionality, where one one of our single-stranded DNAs runs from the 5 to 3, while the other one runs from the 3 to 5. Now, one other thing that we have to notice is that the sugar as well as the phosphate within our double-stranded DNA points outside of that DNA, while inside that double-stranded DNA double helix structure, we have our nitrogenous bases. So that is shown by the following diagram. So this line basically represents the sugar and the phosphate, while these squares represent our nitrogenous bases. And our nitrogenous bases are basically protected and are found inside our double-stranded DNA molecule and that means our bonds can form and those bonds are not dis uh, disrupted by any type of outside force that is found on the outside of that double-stranded DNA molecule. Of course, if we, for example, increase the temperature eventually, 
a temperature will be reached where these bonds will break regardless of the fact that our nitrogenous bases are found inside that DNA molecule. So once again, DNA is basically a polymer molecule that contains nucleotides and any given nucleotide consists of three sections. We have the sugar, the nitrogenous base, and our phosphate group. And there are four different types of nitrogenous bases the purines are adenine and guanine while our pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine now the way that our two anti-parallel single stranded DNAs bond together is via hydrogen bonds between our adjacent nitrogen uh, nitrogenous bases so guanine nitrogenous base always forms bonds with cytosine while adenine always forms bonds with thymine and notice that the way our individual nucleotides in any single stranded DNA form our bonds is via these special types of bonds known as phosphodiester bonds.